All right, you ready? Yeah. Cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Evolve with Emily show. I am your host, Emily Hayden, and today I'm actually in studio. You guys should definitely check out the YouTube video. It's, the quality is going to be much better than normal. I'm in a studio in Las Vegas. I'm traveling, and I figured while I was here, I would hit up some friends and some connections from friends. This one is actually, this interview today is a friend, a mutual friend that we have is Peter Meyerhoff, so shout out to Peter for the hookup. Um, and today we have in studio someone who is a coach a mentor, a motivational speaker, and somebody who is truly using their life experience to make a wave in the world, like a really incredible wave of just, I feel like hope and inspiration to a lot of people that feel like they're hopeless and they lack that inspiration. So today I'm excited to introduce to you guys, Carlos Vasquez. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm excited to talk to you today. So I think the biggest illusion in this world is separation. People thinking that they are separate from each other, that they are separate from God. Yeah. I think sometimes the external things that we go through, even the way that we look, yeah. can provide a layer of separation that truly is just false. Like people could probably look at your story, you know, and we'll get into it a little bit of mm -hmm. being sentenced. What was it? 20 years? Yeah, 20 years. Being sentenced 20 years in prison. You know, they could look at that story and say, oh, I have nothing in common with him. Yeah. Right. Because maybe someone who's listening is a, a girl who grew up in a neighborhood, went to a good school, with a good yeah. family. And, you know, but when we get deeper into your story, we'll actually mm -hmm. see that when you take off all the external things of the actual, you know, life circumstances that we went through, yeah. we all deal with a lot of the same same shit, you know, yeah, like when sure. you get down to it, I was, I was looking into your story just a little bit about how you got into these, you know, this, this really difficult mental struggle and mental battle of mm. feeling like you didn't want to be here. Right. And I think if people are really honest, a lot of us go through that season at some point in our lives. Yeah. I think different things bring it out of us. So I know it's a lot, but I kind of just want to start there with uh, what is your understanding of the world in the terms of the, the separation that I'm talking about, right? Like mm -hmm. people looking at others and thinking that they're so far from them or so far different, or even like the people in prison, right? That yeah. maybe they feel like that could never be them. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts when it just comes to that like idea of separation? Yeah, I think that like in my situation, you know, I grew up in a, in a good neighborhood with both of my parents. I played baseball. I got straight A's. I went to Catholic school. I did everything you would think wow. a kid would do that was set up for success. But all it took was one event in my life to change that, which wow. is, yeah, which is why that separation that you talk about, like, it's, it's like, we're really not all that separated. Wow. One thing can happen they can alter a person's life forever. And for me, it was my father walking out of my life just spontaneously mm. one day just left. And that turned my whole world around because it impacted my mother, my sister, mm. me. And then I ran away from home when I was 13 years old. So that was that that point, you know, that one thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, it also, you know, it, it taught me a lot. It taught me the power of one person, one, one mm. man or woman can have on you, you know? Wow. Yeah, so... And, you know, that's why, like, every single one of us on, on this earth, mm -hmm. you know, like, you may not be the richest, you may not have, you know, be the best looking, be the most fit, whatever it is, but you have value because mm -hmm. one thing you do can alter a person's life and then alter many other people's lives. So, yeah, I, I think the separation thing is, like, it's it's not really that much separation between me and anybody else, my story, and other person. All mm -hmm. it was was one event that changed that. That's yeah. wild, man. Yeah. That's wild to think about, you know, because like you mentioned, sometimes you can do everything right or feel like you're on the right path with everything. And it's like that one unexpected thing can just completely mm -hmm. change your life, sometimes for the good and sometimes for the worse. But it's interesting as you look yeah. back, you realize that those moments of like, wow, that made everything worse. Yeah. Catapults like something that would have never happened had that difficult moment or experience never been in your life. Right. So, OK, I want to get into a little bit of your story here. Um, talk to me a little bit about what it was like at 19 years old to get that 20 year sentence in prison. And what led you to that? Right. You were you said you came with both parents. Yeah. You went to a Catholic school. You had dreams of being a professional baseball player like yeah. everything seemed to be on the right track so talk to me about what led to you getting that sentence yeah so it just you know started off from you know the man that I loved and respected most mm -hmm. walking out of my life and so for me you know at 13 years old when I saw that 
you know, the, the impact that that had on my mother. She went into a deep depression. Mm. She was forced on to take multiple jobs. We lost our home. We were forced to move into a neighborhood that wasn't so good. Mm. My sister got pregnant when she was 16, which was not too much further after my dad left. My mother had to take on the responsibility of that. So for me, it was just so much going on in the household. The one thing I did was I just followed in the footsteps of the man that I love and respected most, which was to run away, mm. you know? So I did, and 13 years old, I ran away, went into the streets, not really knowing where I was gonna go, who I was gonna meet, what was gonna happen. But I think like, for me, I always had this want to explore, you know, to try new things to, so even as a kid, and so that was my way to do that. And then just mm -hmm. running from all the problems. And so, yeah, I ended up um, homeless, you know, at 14 years old, I was sleeping in the, a car and a, apartment, abandoned car, an apartment that, you know, I used to hang out at. It wasn't even your car? No, it wasn't even my car. It was my friend's uh, dad's car that didn't even run, just broken wow. down. I used to sleep in there stealing um, to be able to, you know, eat and then also to, you know, fund my habit. You know, I became mm -hmm. addicted to drugs and alcohol at 14. Wow. And, and shortly after became a gang member because once I got into that world, mm -hmm. I saw the commonality with other people. Like, most of those guys in there didn't have their fathers or their fathers left or their fathers were in wow. prison. So we connected on that. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, I, I ended up becoming a gang member when I was 14 years old. And, you know, shortly after, you know, I met my best friend at the time, who was Chris, who was like a mentor to me, my older brother, um, that he kind of fulfilled that role of, of the father figure that left. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we rode together every day. He taught me how to survive on the streets. He taught me how to, you know, sell drugs, how to do all these things. Um, and, you know, he was, I was 16 years old. He was 19 years old and he committed suicide in front of me. Wow. Yeah, in a drug house. And, and he died on the floor of the drug house in front of me. And that, like, made me even worse because I started to have, you know, nightmares. I had developed PTSD. Mm -hmm. Didn't know it at the time, but, you know, in, in retrospect, uh, when I learned myself, I was like, yeah, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And I became more violent, mm -hmm. you know, and so I started doing um, armed robberies and uh, bank robberies, jewelry store robberies, stuff like that, and building this reputation in that world. Mm -hmm. And that like kept feeding my ego. That mm -hmm. made me feel like I was somebody important. Mm -hmm. I, I got the acceptance from others. And so, you know, I, I got sucked into that. Like I became addicted to that lifestyle, that criminal lifestyle, mm -hmm. the, that criminal thinking and everything that comes with it. And um, yeah, by 19 years old, you know, I was on the run for two armed robberies and um, got caught and, you know, went to uh, and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. So, so I got to that point in a nutshell. Ooh, man. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot to go through at mm -hmm. any age. Doesn't matter what age you are, but especially mm -hmm. at a young age with no one there to help you have tools of like how to navigate through the hard seasons of life. Yeah. You know, so I can only imagine um, what was it like for you when you know you got that sentence? Because I imagine at that time you're separated from all your family. Mm -hmm. So like, did you even did family show up to that sentence? Were they a part of that, or were you handling that on your own? What was that like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the day I got sentenced, um, the only person that was there was my sister. My older sister had came to court that day. And, you know, I didn't know that I was going to, you know, I, t I took 20 years with two strikes. And in California, if you know anything about the law, you know, back in those days, which was early 2000s, you know, three strikes and you're done. You get life in prison. Wow. So the deal that was offered to me was 20 years with two strikes, because all the way up to that point, I was uh, facing life in prison you know, for the crimes that I committed and the gang enhancement, which carried life alone. So um, the only thing that, you know, I was able to, well, I believe, you know, like for me as a spiritual person, I believe that, you know, God definitely intervened in that. And because mm -hmm. so many things led up to where like, you know, I was never supposed to, you know, have a release date. I was never supposed to even be alive to be fighting that in court, but I did. And they the day of before trial, they offered me a deal for 20 years with two strikes. And, you know, I took the deal. Mm -hmm. And when you take 20 years with two strikes at 19 years old and you're going to maximum security prison, it's like that's pretty much a life sentence. Yeah, it's longer than you've been alive. Yeah, as long as I've been alive. And uh, I still don't even know like how I was able to do it. But I think that but late in life, now that I think about it, 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 it just shows like some things you have no choice. You just got to do it. Right. Because some people tell me, like, how could you? I would have never took that. I don't know how you did that. I don't know how you survived that. But 
you have no choice. You just survive. Mm-hmm. You keep going. You know, you don't give up. Mm-hmm. And that was the mindset. Like, I'm just going to go in, take it one day at a time. And I did. And I and I went to prison. Yeah. Wow. So you get to prison, you're mm-hmm. serving your sentence, which feels like an actual lifetime. So it's longer than you'd been alive. Yeah. When you're in there, something switched, right? Mm-hmm. I, I did a little research into your story. So yeah. I've, I've seen that something switched. So when did you have that switch in your mindset from the hopelessness, from the like, this is probably where I'm going to die to yeah. having hope and actually thinking that there was something more meant for your life? Yeah, for me, well, first 10 years in, I was worse than what I went in. Because, wow. Yeah, now I had to go in and I had to prove myself. And the first thing they told me when I went in with the older guys that were in there, like, you got to come in and you got to earn your bones. You got to come in and you got to stab somebody. You got to attack somebody. Anytime that somebody needs to be removed, you need to be volunteering because that's how that's going to protect you later on mm. from, you know, the predators in there that are going to try to take advantage of you because you're young. Right. You know, so that was the mindset going in. Just be violent at all wow. times to continue this, you know, reputation that I had. And so for the first 10 years, I was in and out of the hole, you know, which is, um, you know, solitary confinement mm-hmm. in and out. Um, did a few months in and out back and forth. But it was about a decade in that I was sent to solitary confinement. And I was uh, placed back there for three years. Three years in solitary. Yeah. So, what is that? What is that like for people who have no idea? Like when you say three years in solitary, what is that? What's your daily routine? Yeah. So three years in solitary is, um, you know, like I tell people to this day, like as much as I've grown and changed, like solitary confinement took a piece of me that I don't think will ever be replaced. Mm. But it's like, you know. It's like the pain we deal with in life. Mm-hmm. You know, the pain doesn't lessen. We just grow stronger. You know, it's still there. It's yeah. just I know how to deal with it yeah. now. But basically, it's like for people that don't know, mm-hmm. it's like literally, you know, being in, a, um, you know, six like Peter, you know, our friend. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. One day I went out there and he showed me he had just got a brand new Audi and he showed me he's like, look, this car is the size of my prison cell. Literally, like the inside, that's how small oh, it is. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it just shows how far we've come. <laughs> yeah. But uh, going back to it, yeah, like just imagine being in like a, you know, eight by 10 box, you know, concrete. It's cold. You know, they don't give you, you don't get clothes. You don't, you don't you get one blanket. Um, you're, 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 you're secluded from everybody. And then there's people back there. And if they're back there, you don't know who they are. You never see their face. Wow. Like you may just talk to them. But then even that, like the guards don't want you to talk. They want you to just be like cut off from the world. And it's it was punishment. You know, mm-hmm. it was a lot of punishment. You know, like if you were a person who had an attitude and you were like, like toward the officers, mm-hmm. they would put you in there with somebody who was like a um, a rapist, you know, so they put young oh guys in there with, yeah. Like they do stuff like that, like wow. take, don't feed you, wow. go in there and like take all your stuff, throw your pictures away. So it was a mental battle mm-hmm. more than anything, like- and physical too, because you get no sun, right? You gotta, you gotta, oh only gosh. thing that's like the only thing that like helps, like for me, and I know everybody could attest that has been there, is just working out. That's it. And that's why I always tell people, like, that's my therapy mm. and always has been since mm-hmm. I was in prison. That helped me stay mentally and physically alive, really. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's a, it's more mentally than anything. If you're yeah. not strong minded, you'll break. And that's mm-hmm. what they wanna do is break you back there. And then when they break you, they, they sit you down and they give me all the information you know about everything you've ever done, and then we'll let you out more. They do things like that. Mm-hmm. So it was tough. You know, it was tough. But like I said before, you just do it, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you have no option other than just yeah. to do. Mm-hmm. That takes it to another level, too. Um, okay, talk to me about, you know, I talk a lot on the show about mental health, right? Mm-hmm. And I like talking about that because I think no matter where you're at in life, people deal with it. Yeah. Sometimes people have real life situations like yours that make a ton of fucking sense, like why yeah. you would be sitting there feeling that way. There's yeah. also other people listening that they seem to have that perfect life, right? They yeah. seem to have it all together. Together, and yet they still feel that way. So have you had moments of feeling depressed of not wanting to be here? And how mm-hmm. have you navigated those feelings and those thoughts? And, and what could you say to maybe somebody that may be dealing with those thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in, in, in solitary confinement, um, you know, I got, I became suicidal. You know, I got like, I had been suicidal before in my life. 
Um, and I had I had played Russian roulette, like literally, you know. Um, oh, my God. And not only that, figuratively, too, just taking mm-hmm. chances that would probably get me killed. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really value my life. And in solitary, it was just like I was ready to end it. You know, I wrote a letter to my mother, you know, apologizing, you know, a suicide note. And I put it in my property because I knew once I, they found me dead, she would get my property. Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, I planned it, how I was going to do it. You know, um, there's only one opportunity in there where you could ever get your hands on anything to even do it with. Because, mm-hmm. you know, even if you want to kill yourself, they won't even have anything in there to allow you to do that except for one way. And, you know, that was like, you know, a time when they give you razors to shave. So I was, I was an opportunity there that I was going to just do it there with the razor and kill myself. And I planned it in my mind. And I went through it in my mind and like literally like a day before that I was going to go through with it you know, a man came to my door and he was a chaplain and he, and he, and he spoke to me and he talked to me and he challenged me to, to continue to, to figure out what my purpose was. And I think like for people out there who may be suicidal, you know, have given up, have lost hope, who may feel like that they don't want to be here no more. I think one thing that you have to do is figure out what you ultimately want to accomplish here on earth. Like, what's your purpose? Mm-hmm. Like, because that, once I discovered what my purpose was, mm-hmm. that helped me get through the days where I felt mm-hmm. like giving up. Mm-hmm. And so it's doing it for something bigger than yourself because mm-hmm. I didn't care about myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I cared about, like a lot of people don't, who want to kill themselves. They don't mm-hmm. care about themselves. Yeah. Obviously. So it's like, you have to f- find a way to survive for somebody or something bigger than you. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you grow and start to love yourself mm-hmm. and help yourself. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was like me knowing that I'm doing this for my mother. I'm doing this mm-hmm. for all those people out there in the world that, that need me to help them. They mm-hmm. need me to get out and impact their lives. Mm-hmm. And so that was what got me through it. So that's what I say to people that are out there. If you don't care about yourself, don't do it for you. Figure out something bigger than yourself, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friend, or even a cause that you want to like help. Maybe something resonates with you, like, um, you know, something you've been through, domestic violence. Maybe you're Mm -hmm. doing it so you can help other people. Mm -hmm. And that is going to help you to make it through that one more day. Because ultimately, when you're at that point, that's all you have is one more day. Mm -hmm. You can't really think too far Mm -hmm. ahead. So. That would be my advice, like to people like that. Yeah, well, I couldn't have said that yeah. better, and I, I agree. Sometimes finding that source of inspiration outside of yourself, you know, for right. someone that you love or someone, you know, I think one thing we can all really relate to is just at the end of the day, pain, right? Mm-hmm. We know what pain is. We experience it differently. We go through different things, but we all know what that's like. And I know for myself, at least, if I see yeah. someone going through something and I know I can help them, all I want to do is help them. All right. I want to do is help show them the way and say like, hey, this helped me. Yeah. So I agree that can sometimes bring you out of a really dark hole is by not focusing on yourself so much, just getting out and being of service Mm -hmm. and doing whatever you can to help the people around you. Yeah. So, okay. I want to talk a little bit about faith. You've mentioned a few times, like being a man of faith, Mm -hmm. where did faith come into your life? Is this something that you grew up with and how has your understanding of faith and God, Mm -hmm. how has it evolved throughout the years? Yeah. So faith uh, is something that I've always battled with, you know, from, uh, I was a kid, you know, I went to Catholic school, I went to church. And then like when my father left, you know, I grew distant from God. You know, Mm -hmm. I stopped praying. I stopped going to church. I stopped even thinking about God. I stopped believing. I went to prison. Same thing, you know, for years, always felt like God turned his back on me. You know, the mindset I had back then was to blame everybody else but myself, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, when solitary confinement, when the chaplain came and he he gave me the Bible. He slid me a Bible under this under the door and he told me to start reading it. He mm-hmm. told me, he challenged me to figure out what my purpose was because I had one. And it was really just the only thing was the challenge that he gave me. Mm-hmm. Uh, me like always feeling like I'll never turn down a challenge like mm-hmm. that, that. And also, you know, him um, giving me his time, him acknowledging mm-hmm. me and acting and showing that he actually cared. And that's another powerful thing. Wow. If you know somebody's going through something mm-hmm. like you know, what you say to them matters. Like Mm -hmm. words are powerful. The words he told me literally like kept me alive for another day. Mm -hmm. So just know that like your value, your words have value. So don't think that they don't. If you see somebody struggling, going through somebody, going through something or they're in it, or you just feel something's wrong, say something to them, speak to them. That could change their whole world. And it did for me. And so he, um, he told me to start reading the Bible and I did, I opened the Bible again. I started reading it Mm -hmm. and, you know, I started, then after I started reading it, I started praying 
And I started reading and praying every day. And step by, you know, every day, step by mm-hmm. step, I was getting closer and closer to God and get, and building my relationship back with God. Mm-hmm. And then it was through God, through my faith, that I found the confidence to be able to leave solitary confinement and go back into the general population as this new person, you know, and that, op- and I knew that there was a, a, a lot of risk in that, you know, like. What's the risk in that? The risk is exactly what happened to me, which was I got stabbed two times, but getting stabbed two times. You know, because I changed my life, I always said, like, mm-hmm. if I'm going to die, at least I'm going to die, you know, a man who changed his life, mm-hmm. who went out on his own terms, me, Carlos, not this other identity that I had created. Mm-hmm. That my mother was going to bury, you know, somebody who was actually trying to do something right mm-hmm. now. Wow. So I, I, I became like, I, I was at peace with that. And, you know, I was, you know, met with challenges when I got out, more mm-hmm. battles. And that was it. You know, I got stabbed two times, you know, and. I just went in the cell and my friend stitched me up and then went back out there and continued to pursue my purpose, which is to inspire positive transformation in others every chance I get. So I started doing that. And and so, you know, with, amongst all that, within mm-hmm. all that, me helping others, you know, God, you know, was with me along that journey and he mm-hmm. still is with me to this day. And I'm still fighting, you know, um, every day, you know, mm-hmm. different things that like, you know, negativity, negative people, the demons, the thoughts and all these mm-hmm. things. But it's always, I always start my day acknowledging God first before I do anything else in my routine, you know, and, and you know, I acknowledge God all throughout my day. Everything like I could be driving down the street and I'm, and I'm just looking, I'm just so happy to be out and I thank God. So I think that when it comes to like having a relationship with God or mm-hmm. whatever you believe in, it's just incorporating that in your day all day. You know, like, yeah, that's good. Take it with you, you know? Yeah. Rather you know? than like a weekly thing or just like a church service that you attend, making it like your life, your living expression of your life. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. That's amazing. Question, kind of a random offbeat question, sure. but like, for example, sometimes I'll pick up the Bible and I'm like, what? Right. You like yeah. read it and you're like, sorry, can you, yeah. what? Can you say that in English? Yeah. As you're like in solitary, there's no one to help you explain this. You can't Google yeah. it. Like you can't look for interpretations. Right. How are you navigating this and not being like, screw this and like throwing yeah. it out. Right. Like, yeah. how are you navigating? I'm sure you had those thoughts too. Right. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. It's, it always starts with just prayer. You know, it's, mm. it's crazy. It's like for some people, they, they may not think it's that easy just to pray for understanding, you know, pray and, and those are the things I still do today. Yeah. Like pray for understanding, pray for strength, pray for me to be able to have the voice that I need to impact these people that I'm speaking to and coaching and mentoring in a positive way. And I'm telling you, that's just such a powerful thing for me. It's because like it almost takes the pressure off of me because it's not a, it's not me trying to understand the Bible. It's it's God showing me what I need to see in it. Ooh. You know what I mean? That. Yeah, so <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So it's powerful. And the more you do it, mm-hmm. then the more you become more confident mm-hmm. in what you're doing, whether it's reading the Bible. And and the thing is like always, you know, be a be a lifelong learner. So for me, like a lot of the understanding I got from the Bible as well as my past and where I had become, where I had got to the point where I become was because I just read every book that I can get my hands on, you Mm. know, everything, psychology, books, Mm -hmm. fiction, nonfiction, whatever it is. And you find things in there that that somehow you can pull from those things when you're reading the Bible, you Mm. know, like whether it's like analogies or stories or something, you you start to connect the dots. And I believe it's, 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 you know, it's God like providing you ways to help you along your path, Mm -hmm. not just with the Bible, Mm -hmm. but just, just be a seeker of knowledge. And to this day, that's what I do. I spend every day, you know, I spend at least an hour every day just studying, reading or something because that's like working out. Every day mm-hmm. I work out, every day I study. So you have mental, physical, you got to work on everything, spiritual. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 if you do that, then you, you'll you be good. Yeah, be no good. kidding. Yeah. So uh, from everything that you shared, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the show how like one person can drastically change your life, like in a really good way or in a sometimes very difficult way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I imagine that mentorship is a huge part of what you do in, in your coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you found is the best way to be a mentor or to be a coach to others? Like what makes you a good mentor or a coach? Well, for one, I'm 
I mean, it's obvious leading by example, mm -hmm. you know, like, especially if you're on social media mm -hmm. then you're whatever you put out there, you just got to lead by example. You're going, you're going to go through adversity. You're going to go through pain. You're going to go through struggle. It's how do you handle that? You know, like, are you incorporating the things that you're teaching in your own life? Mm -hmm. So you have to lead by example. And then you have to find like a commonality with a, whoever it is that you're coaching and mentoring, because like how you said, we all had pain, you know, we've mm -hmm. all dealt with something and there's commonality in that. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be afraid to talk on those things and speak on them and be open about them. Because once you're open about open about those deep, intimate, hurtful things, mm -hmm. then it's like you're okay with fully expressing everything you're going through. And that's when the transformation occurs with the coaching. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard to coach and mentor somebody who won't open up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So absolutely. So yeah, it's building those those connections and and, and finding those common groups grounds that you can meet a person on. And I, I feel everybody can connect in some way with mm -hmm. something and that's mm -hmm. a start. And so doing that, and then also just like having, you know, not like trying to make things too complicated, you know, like mm -hmm. trying to keep things, keep things simple, mm -hmm. you know, stick to the basics and then just build there because a lot of people are, are, you know, afraid or turned off by mentoring and coaching and stuff because they feel that they're going to have to go do all this stuff and do extra work and all that. But, you know, it just depends on what you want. Because for mm -hmm. me, I want that. I want to be challenged and extra mm -hmm. work. So uh, a person that coaches me, they're going to know how to how to approach that. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing your client, knowing who you're dealing with, mm -hmm. knowing your audience. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, yeah, being aware of all that. Yeah, that's good. And just tailoring it to the individual. Because like you said, everyone's there for different things. Right. So question, how to battle. That's your Instagram tag. Everyone yeah. go follow him at how to battle on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Why is that the name? Because when I first got out of prison, um, I had to teach myself how to do everything, right? Um, I literally was spending, like, I've been out 19 months now, you know, mm -hmm. I, I had to teach myself how to even create an email. You mm -hmm. know, I had, I had been gone so long to where, you know, smartphones were new to me. Technology was new to me. Creating an email was new to me. I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to build a website. Then I kept challenging myself, mm -hmm. like, how do I build these social media platforms? How everything was always how to do something. And so, you know, for me, it was always like, okay, so what about the daily battles that we go through every day? We go and battle something, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it may be, big or small. So it's like, for me, it was always like, I'm going to be that that person, you know, and my business is going to be that business to where we help people win the battles they undertake, whatever it is, you know, but mainly mental, you know, and, mm. and physical. So that's that's and, and spiritual. So it's mm. all three. But it started it started with the mindset, because for me, that's most important. You get your yeah. mind right. Everything else will follow. You'll start working out. You'll start being more so disciplined, true. but you got to get your mindset right. So it always starts with there. So that's how it, how it came to pass. And it's crazy. I, uh like uh, I'm, uh, I flew out here from LA and um, there was a napkin on the Southwest airline and it said, uh, all great ideas start here. It was on the napkin. And that's actually where I wrote the name of my company down on a napkin when I thought no about way. it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think, you know, we are taught so many things in school, right? We're mm -hmm. taught English and math and algebra and all these things that now we can honestly just Google, yeah. but we're not given tools of how to navigate life. You know, mm -hmm. and I feel like I wish that there would be like an educational reform where we could actually mm -hmm. teach things that we really need in school, you know, like yeah. how to even like how to communicate or yeah. healthy relationships and what that looks like. Because mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of these pieces that make the human experience either so much better or so much harder mm -hmm. based on what you were taught. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of people that never had a father that never yeah. had that father figure. Why do you think we have such a... Um, such a world, such a society and generation right now that is fatherless. Like, what do you think, what do you think that, um, kind of effect is creating in the world? Like, like why should fathers care about yeah. being fathers to the children that they have? Great. It's a great question. Um, uh, because like, I, it's, it's so important to have your father in your life and for all the fathers out there listening, like, I mean, I can't overstate the importance of that. Like for me, that changed my whole world. And I've seen people, their whole world changed because of their fathers getting killed or mm -hmm. going to prison. And I've seen fathers and sons in prison together, you know, in the cell together. So, wow. yeah. So, you know what I think? It's just about, it's just, it's selfishness, you know, like as men, a lot of men, you know, they have kids and, and it's like, they are only concerned about themselves and how they feel, you know, and what's in their own uh, wants and needs. Mm -hmm. And so it's about putting 
somebody else above you. And I believe when you have kids, when you when you when you do that, you gotta now put somebody else before you sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. Obviously you gotta work on yourself because you wanna be at your best to be the best for others. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, had my father, you know, been there in my life or even like let's say he had to leave, do it the right way. You know, mm-hmm. so sometimes things don't work out. Relationships yeah. don't work yeah. out. I, I, I respect that, but you got to just do things the right way and put yourself mm-hmm. in the shoes of the people that you're impacting. Like, how would you feel if you did, you know, if you walked out on, on, you know, if somebody walked out on you, how do you think you would feel? Mm-hmm. And so being empathetic, you know, and being able to understand that, you know, and not just being so impulsive and just reacting, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So as men, I believe that, and women too, though, just have that responsibility mm-hmm. to be conscious of everything you do, every move you make. You're a parent now, you know, people, a, a, child, a child relies on you. Mm-hmm. So every decision you make is important. Mm-hmm. So being more conscious of that. And if you're more conscious of that every day, every day, you know, then your chances of being successful in that area of parenting mm-hmm. is going to be far higher. So, and it's all about chances because nothing's guaranteed, yeah. but the better chance, the better you set yourself up for, the better chance you have a success. So, Absolutely. Yeah. One thing that kept coming to mind while you were talking mm-hmm. is just the word value and like people really understanding their value. And I imagine that some fathers and mothers that maybe have walked away from their kids truly did not understand the value that they held and the value that their children even held in them. You know, part of me just feels like maybe they just don't understand the value, the importance that they hold in those kids' lives. So Mm -hmm. what can people do to start to understand their own value more? You know, like Mm -hmm. even from you and your experience, you being in solitary confinement, Mm -hmm. like I imagine you had all sorts of negative thoughts, right? Like, why am I even here? Like all these things, right? So how did you start to realize like, hold on a second, like my life has value. My life has purpose. Like what what helped you understand that value more? Mm -hmm. I think it's acknowledging all your wins in life, you know, like because see, People, we, you know, we all, we tend to compare ourselves to others a lot yeah. and, um, and not taking the time out to pat yourself on the back for all the wins that you've had in life. That's even, true. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even if it's something as minor as, like I tell young people when I, I mentor them and stuff, I always tell them like, okay, so uh, like in the beginning of the year, like, you know, you're the strug- the subject you struggle with most, whatever it may be, or whatever you're struggling with most you know, ha- have you improved in some way, in, in some form in that way? And then there's always, yes, there's mm-hmm. always some way they've improved in something. Mm-hmm. I learned how to drive this year, you know, yeah. um, I've learned how to, I'm a better basketball player, so whatever it may be. So taking that time out to acknowledge your wins and know mm-hmm. that you do have something within you. Mm-hmm. There's something there. You, you have the ability to grow, right? You have it. You've seen it. Here's the proof. You've done it in the past. But now it's just like optimizing that, like mm. now stepping it up a notch yeah. and, and growing and growing that and growing that. But it's about confidence. It's about you becoming confident in yourself to be more, to achieve more. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Once you have that, then it starts to manifest. Mm-hmm. So it's a, so it's just about helping the individual find those pieces in their life that they've had wins. And not, yeah. not to focus on the losses all the time, the wins and be like, look, you have value. Mm-hmm. It's there it is there. So keep working on that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so that's building gold, on man. That. Yeah. That's gold because sometimes yeah. when you get into a rough patch, it's like all of a sudden you have no memory of all the great things that you did even years ago, even yeah. if it's been a couple of years. So I think what you're saying is really powerful and important to look back and really acknowledge those things. Cause like you said, it's like um, I always say like when people are going through a rough time and they're like, man, I don't know if I can make it out of this. It's mm-hmm. like, when's, when's the last time you felt like this? Right. Oh, well, when this happened in my family. Okay. And you're here. Yeah. So like 100% of the time you've made it through these things that you thought that you couldn't make it through. Yeah. Right. So again, it's just kind of like looking at the proof in, in your um, history and what you've already been through. Yeah. Um, earlier, I wanted to talk on this, but you said that you got out of solitary and you went back into general pop, right? And that's when you started your work and your purpose. Like you didn't mm-hmm. even wait until you were out of prison. Like you still yeah. did it in prison. Yeah. Yeah. And we're obviously people were not receptive to it in some ways, but mm-hmm. like how, how was the receptivity? Like what did the other inmates think? What kind of impact were you able to have? Were you having conversations? Were you doing like speaking things? Mm-hmm. Like how does that work there? Yeah. So um, you know, before I went to solitary confinement, you know, I, I have been a shot caller on the prison yard for many years. I know what that is. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and so 
when you become a shot caller and, and it's like you like you almost commit your life to it. So it was blood in, blood out. Like there's no way out. And so that's why I knew when I changed my life around, I was going to exit solitary confinement and go back to general population that I was going to be met with some type of, you know, backlash for that change, which, um, you know, is, is a lot of the reason why people can't change is because they mm -hmm. know they, they think of the consequences. But for me, it was like I was OK with that. I was willing to die. So then mm. for, for this, I was willing to die for a cause that wasn't right. So now I'm going to I'm willing to die for something that is. Wow. So I went back out there and, you know, I, I got stabbed. And but but that was what changed everything, because once I got stabbed and everybody knew the situation that happened, and they seen that that wasn't going to stop me, like that I was still going to continue to pursue this this changed life that I had is like. People just, mm. and I don't know, it's, it has to be God, but but it just seemed like it had an adverse effect. Yeah. It was like more people were empowered by that. <laughs> wow. You know, so. so <laughs> That's I, yeah, wild. Yeah, it was like weird and, and, and it still surprised me to this day, but I know that like there's power in being like a leader and mm -hmm. taking a chance. And mm -hmm. sometimes people need to be inspired by another person so that they can release what they have inside. And that's what happened was a lot of the people wanted to change and when they finally seen that, like somebody do it, mm -hmm. who was like just like them at some point, mm -hmm. um, not just the guy who went into prison and never did anything, but a guy who was completely like in that world, you know, a shot caller and all that to change like that, mm -hmm. it was empowering to the others. So we started formulating groups in the in the chapel, and we were doing uh, insight workshops and self development groups, and everybody in there was almost like ninety percent of everybody in there was lifers, and they all started to have breakthroughs and understandings, and we start to open up, and the change started to occur, and that's when I knew like that's my purpose, you know, wow. like to to be like you know, a leader and mentor and coach and help people to transition their lives in positive ways. And so, um, yeah, it was amazing. And it's crazy because a lot of those guys that I, we used to teach in that group, they're, they're, they're getting out and they're out right now. Wow. Yeah. And I just took one of them. Um, we went out to dinner like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. He just got out and, and like, I'm just like, this is what I always envisioned, you know, like being able to see you free, like mm -hmm. with your family and all wow. that. This is what we dreamed about. And, and it's happening because, you know, it, it wasn't easy, but we made it happen. So yeah, yeah, it's like you guys got a whole nother chance at life. Yeah, that's incredible. Sure. And one thing that came to mind, right? You said that like initially you got out and you got stopped twice for this like mm -hmm. massive change. It's that verse that's like everything that the enemy meant for evil, God will turn around and use it for good. So I'm not surprised yeah. to hear that what was meant to kill you literally like catapulted you with more respect and more reverence from the people around you. Right. And you know the way I think about it is like, yeah, when you see something like that happen, you're like either this dude is crazy, like yeah. literally crazy, yeah. or like he feels like this is so truthful. This is so yeah. authentic to him. He's literally willing to die for it. So I can only yeah. imagine the kind of change and ripple effect that that had in, in that community. Yeah. So yeah. for those people that are going through major life change, maybe they're people that are just now getting out, you yeah. know, and maybe they're not related to prison. Maybe it's just major life change, right? They're going from one thing in their life to maybe moving across the country or a new job or new this, just knew everything. Mm -hmm. How do you adapt and handle change when it seems very overwhelming, very new, very just like freaking you the hell out, right? Like how do you adapt to change? Yeah, that's a good one because um, like, you know, I, I've lived that, you know, adapting to change. Like when I got out, everything was new to me. So I did 17 years in there and it's so much changed. So I think the first thing is like, just like knowing yourself, like mm -hmm. knowing what you can handle Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of people, you know, they need to get out and they need to adjust in a certain way, meaning like they have to, you know, um, they take time to learn things, you know, they don't like to move too quick. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was kind of like the opposite. I've always been a person to just go after everything mm -hmm. head on. Yeah. So knowing yourself, like knowing what you could handle mm -hmm. and being OK with that, you know, but every day trying to work on on getting closer and closer to where you want to be. So if you're in the, if you're getting out, you're moving to somewhere mm -hmm. and it's brand new. First of all, too, being grateful too. Just being grateful for what you have every day is a way that you could start the day. And then that alone is gonna give you some momentum when you go into it. So mm -hmm. it's just like knowing, you know, knowing yourself, being grateful for what you have, that you have an opportunity to start a, to start new, a fresh start, mm -hmm. you know? And it may not even be in a place where you wanna be. Because when I went to prison, mm -hmm. you know, that was a start of something. Yeah, no, right? no it was Yeah, it was, <laughs> when I went to solitary, it was a start of something. But yeah, it's what wow. you decide to do within that place that you're at. 
And wow. if you decide to go into prison and look at it as like, this is like a, a Shaolin temple for me, I'm going to go in there and work on myself mentally, physically, spiritually, and get out and be the best version of myself I could be. Or you can go in there and get addicted to drugs get mm-hmm. and get involved with the wrong people. So it's all a choice too. So mm-hmm. it's just about like having that, knowing yourself and being like, okay, this is what I want to do mm-hmm. and, and, and going for it. Yeah. What you're saying is just true throughout all facets of life, right? Life is not yeah. what happens to us, but what we do with what happens to us, like how we respond to that. Yeah. And yours is definitely like an extreme example, right? Like you're in prison you have two yeah. choices here. Like you can go down this path or go down this path. And like your own experience, some people yeah. go down one path for a long time and make a, a severe change to go the opposite direction. And what I'm hearing and seeing from you now is that like now you're this person that went from the kid who whose dad walked away, who started going Mm -hmm. down this path of gangs and violence and purposelessness and not feeling worthy of being here, feeling like you have no value Mm -hmm. to really being confident and understanding that you have a lot of value, that you make a lot of change, that even just a word, a sentence from your mouth could inspire hope in literal life into somebody. That is something that is just like the the transformation, the evolution of like who you are to who you are now is absolutely incredible. And like, I really got to give you props for that. A lot of people could not make it through the things that you went through and make sense why God gave, you know, you the strength that you needed to get through Mm -hmm. because this was your life path and your life journey. And you've had to carry that damn cross like so through so many things. So I just want to encourage you that like you're right. Your voice really does matter. And what you have to say, it really does inspire people from all walks of life, not just people that are in prison and getting out and that kind of thing. Right. Like you inspire everybody. So Mm -hmm. I know that as confident as you are, we all have good and bad days, but don't ever let those bad days or those negative thoughts like come across because you can talk to literally anybody and anyone with an open mind and perspective will gain a lot from it. So thank you for what you do and what you share. And I just, I hope you'll continue to coach and mentor and lead Mm -hmm. the way that you do because you're really uh, just such a valuable person here on this earth, truly. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, of course. So if people are interested in hearing more about you, maybe they want to book you to speak at an event. Maybe they want to hire hire you as a coach, a mentor. Um, Where can they get in contact with you? What kind of offerings do you have? Is there, you know, any sort of thing, uh, coaching service or anything that you want to plug? Go ahead. Yeah. So thank you. Um, So yeah, www.howtobattle.com. That's my website. Um, You go on there, you'll see like links to my social media, which is at How to Battle at Instagram. Uh, TikTok and YouTube I have a YouTube channel as well where I interview like amazing people from not just prison but all kind of walks of life. Yeah. Um, and then that's like going to transition over next. My next project is to do a podcast as Hell well. Yeah, yeah, let's so, go. yeah. So um, that'll be coming on there. And um, yeah, so you can find everything there. And then you'll see on my website like some of the uh, work that I've been doing, some of the talks that I've been doing. There's links to that and working with the youth and, and coaching mm-hmm. and stuff. So yeah, just um, and you know, like, like for me, you know, my whole I know what my purpose is here. You know, I, I I've created my own personal mission, my own personal vision, and I suggest everybody does that, mm-hmm. just like a business does. You have a mission statement and a vision statement, so mm-hmm. create your own personal one, you know, and put mm-hmm. it up on the wall, write it down, whatever. Live by that daily, mm-hmm. you know, because for me, that's what I do. So everything that I align myself with in life. Is, is right in relation to my personal mission and vision. Mm-hmm. And if you do that, that's that's purpose right there. That's gonna, mm-hmm. every day you got something to be enthusiastic about. You got something to go after. And that's what I love is when people are like living their purpose, doing what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm doing. So I'll never quit. I'll never settle. I'll never do anything else. I'm gonna keep building it, you know, and, and I'm, I've been out 19 months and made a lot of progress and I'm gonna keep growing. So follow me and, and, you know, and I hope that you can reach out to me if you need some coaching, mentoring, or speaking. I'm yeah, here. So, dope. Thank you. thank you so much for your time today. And yeah. uh, everybody that's here, you guys know the drill. If you enjoyed today's show, please do us a favor and share it. You can text it to a friend that might need to hear this message. Share it in your Instagram stories. Feel free to tag both of us. His Instagram is linked down below as well as all of his contact information. And I just want to reiterate just to kind of like recap the show here for you guys. No matter who you are and no matter what you've been through. Your life has purpose and your life has value. And there is something that you're meant to do here on this earth. And it's greater than something that you could ever imagine right now. So don't doubt yourself. Don't give into the negative thoughts. Don't give those negative thoughts more realty or more space inside of your head. 
you have to start to get your mind right. If you can get your mind right, everything else will follow your body, your business, your relationships, your purpose, everything. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Don't be afraid to utilize any resources that you need to get your life and your mind on track. Um, and just know that things will get better. The sun will come out again and you will be able to make an impact in this world the way that you were always meant to. And guess what? You probably don't want to hear this, but that shit that you're going through is going to be what creates the biggest impact. So don't shy away from it. Just keep fighting through, keep battling through. Thank you guys. And we'll see you in the next episode of Evolve with Emily. All right. Beautiful. We're good. That was so dope. Yeah, you're you're